it's with, when you're online, everything has to be precise. You don't have the buffer you have in a regular classroom, right? Professor. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question. With uh, DCF uh, deliverable, should we expect kind of like an on track, off track uh, kind of um, feedback, or is it going to be more uh, detailed? Well, I think we're, there's nothing I can say about specific inputs. I'm not going to look at your revenue growth and say that looks off for you, because in a sense, it's your story to tell. So all I'm going to point your attention to is things that might be missing in, you know, in, in inconsistencies, perhaps in your valuation or something in your story that doesn't make sense. So it'll be more, it'll be more diffuse because I mean, what, what can I, if you're using my spreadsheet, it's already got built in most of the, the, the constraints to prevent you from hanging yourself. So if you're building your own spreadsheet, then it's more work for me, but I'll try to find things. But if you've got 500 line items, you might as well give up. I, I, I really can't even tell what's going wrong. But if you built a spreadsheet, I'll try to find it, you know, the, the detail that's, give, that's, that's an issue for you. But otherwise, it'll just be general consistency issues. You know, you know what I mean by consistency, right? Your growth and your reinvestment don't match up. Your market looks way too big at the end of your 10. It might be more in the form of a question. Clear red flags, right? Yep. In fact, there's a diagnostic worksheet that I've been, you know, if you're using my spreadsheet, if you look at that diagnostic worksheet, it actually has the red flags already embedded in it. And many are already, the, the defaults built into the spreadsheet prevent you from kind of getting those red flag prompts in the first place. Like I prevent you, know. Thank you. Yeah, I, like I prevent your growth rate in perpetuity, I, the default is set to equal to the risk free rate. One of the red flags is when you set a growth rate of 4%, your risk free rate is 0.85%, that's a problem. No. So if you override the default and you, or you know, open up the, the issue, then I'll say maybe you'd need to rethink that. Okay, folks, it's time and welcome and uh, people are still joining. But um, at the end of the last session, I kind of opened the door to what valuation is all about. And uh, if you remember, I said, if you're, if you're all you're doing is valuing money making companies with a lot of stable history, valuation classes would last 15 minutes. It'd be easy to value any company. So what we're going to talk about today are difficult to value companies. And we're going to start by looking across the life cycle. I'm going to start with the group that most com most people don't even try to value, young companies. The defense that, the, that people offer is too difficult to value, too much uncertainty. I'm going to start with that because I think those companies not only can be valued, but they should be valued because that's where you may see the biggest mistakes. Then I'm going to talk about mature companies. Normally mature companies are easy to value, but I'm going to talk about the circumstances which make them difficult to value. Like what? Like when they're facing change, they're facing a restructuring. That restructuring is often forced upon them by an activist investor, by a group of investors who are not happy by the pathway they're adopting. So we're going to talk about mature companies in transition and what makes valuation of those companies difficult to challenging. And finally, I'm going to close the life cycle by looking at what I think is the most depressing part of valuation is to value declining companies. Companies facing distress and that should raise the question about what if failure is, is, a, is an imminent possibility, how do you bring that into the analysis? That's what we're going to cover for the bulk of today. But as we go through these next couple of sessions, we're also going to talk about emerging market companies. And we're going to talk about valuing companies across sectors, commodity companies, financial service companies, companies with intangible assets. So we have a lot on our menu, so let's get started. Let's start with young companies. Okay? There are four basic questions I said we need to answer when you value any company. They're kind of generic questions. What are your cash flows from existing assets? What is the value of future growth? How risky are you as a company? When will you become a mature company? Every company, those are the four basic questions. Let's think about why young companies are difficult to value. And to see why they're difficult to value, I'd like you to play a role. Play the role of an entrepreneur. You've started a young company. It's got lots of promise, great potential. And I come to you with these four questions. You ready? You're the entrepreneur, you own this business, young business, lots of potential. Ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? What's the answer going to be to that? 
be a young company, just started, lots of potential. What are your cash flows from existing assets? Yeah, you're saying, what existing assets? I own nothing. I don't even own the chair I sit in. So that was easy. Your cash flows from existing assets are non-existent. I say, okay, that's good. Then I ask you, what's your value from future growth? You say, a lot. And I say, can you be more precise? Not really. You don't have a business model. You don't have a sense of your market. You don't have a sense of how much to charge for your product. So it's kind of diffuse. The value of growth is there, but you have nothing to back it up. No history, no margins, no return on capital, a lot. And I ask you, how risky are you? I say, very. Beyond that, what precision can you give me? You don't have past prices, past earnings. Again, there's nothing to back it up. Then I ask you, when will your company become a mature company? And you fall out of your chair laughing. You don't even know whether you'll make it through this evening. Every single question in value on companies becomes difficult to answer. That's why I said most people don't try to value young companies. You're saying, but VCs do. Hey, VCs don't value companies. They price them. I've kind of said this over and over. They price them by looking at what other people are paying. And their excuse for not valuing companies is there's too much uncertainty. In fact, let's load up the dice and let's think about what makes this process so much, uh, no, so much more complicated, especially in sectors that are evolving. Think about the three places you go to get information you value a company, any company. So if you've been valuing a company, and I hope you have, the first place you went to was probably their last annual report, their 10K, their financial filings. So the first place you start is with the current financials of the company. The second place you look is you look at the history. Why? Because you get a sense of what's a good year, what's a bad year, what happened during the last recession. So you look at a company's history. And third, you look at other companies in the sector. Why? Because you want to get a sense of what's good, what's bad, what happens to companies as they age in the sector. So in summary, there are three places you go for information. Your company's financials, its history, and the peer group to see what it looks like. One by one, I'm going to knock your crutches out and let's see how much more difficult valuation gets. Let's say you're valuing a young company early in its life cycle. So when you look at its current financials, what are you going to see? Not much. You take a, at Zoom's last annual report, you don't see much there because the company wasn't doing much. So the current financials are not very useful. It's a young company, so it doesn't have a lot of history, so that doesn't help you. Then you look at every other company in the sector, they're all young companies early in the life cycle. There's not much you're going to be able to learn by looking at other companies in the sector. You have no history, no financials, no comparables. This is when the dark side will beckon. You're saying, what's the dark side look like? You talk about paradigm shifts, which basically means you have no idea what's going on, so you call it a paradigm shift. You invent metrics that nobody's seen before. Market value per website visitor, market value per member, market value per subscriber. And you tell me story, story after story to kind of justify evaluation. And most of the stories you tell me are macro stories. So I've asked you, why should I buy Zoom? And what's it trading at, 175 per, per share? You say, because everybody's online. That's not a really good reason, but that's all you can come up with. That's what I call the dark side evaluation. And the dark side will beckon whenever you're valuing these companies in sectors where every company looks like yours. This has happened over history in every young sector. It happened with the PC business in the 1980s, with the e-commerce business in the 1990s, with the online advertising companies in the last decade, with the cannabis stocks two years ago, with online meetings slash delivery companies today. So when the dark side beckons, you're going to say, look, I can't value these companies. I'm just going to price them. I still remember in the late 1990s, I do these valuation sessions and I would talk about valuing young companies. At the end of the session, somebody would come up to me and say, you really cannot value Amazon.com using a discounted cash flow model. Can you? And the risk of great personal injury, I'd say, yes, you can value Amazon using a discounted cash flow model. And they'd give me this look of total contempt. They say, academic. And the way they said it wasn't meant as a compliment. Basically, the impl implicit message there was, hey, you can talk about it, but you really can't value these companies. And after the fifth or sixth time of being called an academic, I got really pissed off and I decided to value Amazon for the first time. I valued Amazon for the first time in 1997. And if you remember early in this class, I said that valuation is a craft you learn by doing. 
And Amazon to me was a company on which I learned how to value young companies because there was no template available in 97 when I sat down to value Amazon. In fact, the first time I valued Amazon in 97, I kept a journal, a journal of what every roadblock I ran into in terms of estimation and how I got around that roadblock. And by the time I was done with my Amazon valuation in 1997, the journal was 75 pages long. So you know what I did? I never waste anything I write. I slapped a title on it. The dark side of valuation can Amazon.com be valued. I posted it on my website. That became the first edition of the dark side of valuation. So what I'm going to do is take you back, not all the way to 1997, but to early 2000, and take you through a valuation of Amazon I did in 2000 because you're going to see the seeds of how I value young companies today in that original valuation. Ready? So let's go back in a time machine. It's January 2000. The dot-com boom is booming. You're at the peak of the boom. Amazon.com is the poster child for the sector. The stock is trading at $84 per share. And here's what Amazon looked like leading into 2000. Incidentally, this was one of the first live webcasts that the CFA did. So it was a webcast edit, and I remember the title for the webcast. It said, no earnings, no, ca no earnings, no history, no comparables, no problem. So valuation of Amazon, I did. And this is what Amazon looked like at the start of 2000. It had revenues of $1.1 billion. Now, revenues of $1.1 billion for a retail firm in the U.S. are tiny revenues. Just to give you a sense of contrast, even in 2000, Walmart had $150 billion to $200 billion in revenues. Costco is $50 billion. The gap had $20 billion. A billion in revenues made Amazon a small company. And it was losing $410 million. So losing a lot of money. It's operating margin. If you divide the operating loss of $410 million by the revenues, it was minus 36.7%. So I'm going to start with the question. Can a company with small revenues and big operating losses become a valuable company? And the answer is absolutely, right? Every company at one point in its life was a company with small revenues and big operating losses and think of what has to happen. First, the small revenues have to become big revenues, right? Simplistic, but let's go there. So small revenues have to become big revenues. The second is the losses have to become profits. Otherwise, the company is worth nothing. So you have the first two big assumptions I have to make. And in fact, I still have to make whenever I value a young company. The first is revenue growth. For Amazon, I estimated a compounded annual revenue growth of 42% a year for the next 10 years. Now, part of you is probably saying, why 42%? Why not 45? Why not 35? I'll come in and fill in the story that backs up these numbers, but I assumed a compounded revenue growth of 42% a year. I still remember while I was doing this live webcast, it was old fashioned, people were emailing questions to me. And the first question that came in right after I said the 42% was, how come you're being so pessimistic about future growth? I think, I mean, my reaction is pessimistic. I mean, think of what I'm doing. I'm making a billion dollars in revenues into 40 billion in year 10. And you're accusing me of being pessimistic. You know why it sounded pessimistic though? Because in the previous year, Amazon's revenues had grown 200% a year. So the question the person was asking actually made sense. He was asking, how come you're bringing the revenue growth from 200 to 42%? What he was missing was the compounded in the 10 years. I wasn't actually assuming 42% every year for the next 10 years. I was assuming 150% in year one, but as the company got bigger, I had to bring the growth rate down. Why? Because the company, it was scaling up. I thought 42% was a pretty optimistic number. And again, I haven't justified why exactly 42%. But half my job has been accomplished. I've made small revenues into big revenues, at least on my spreadsheet. My second big question was, I know they're losing a lot of money, minus 36.71%. I had to decide what kind of margin they would have if they became a successful company. And in 2000, I'll be quite honest, I saw Amazon as a retail company. So here's what I chose as my target margin. I said, once they get past the growing pains, their margins are going to look like the margins for brick and mortar retailers, which in early 2000, those margins on a pre-tax basis were 10%. You're saying, why do you use online retailers? Because they're all like Amazon losing money. 
So over time, I assumed that Amazon's margins, minus 36.7%, would move towards 10%. Again, not overnight. I'm being realistic that they will continue to lose money, but they will over time see their margins improve. Second question comes in, how come you're being so pessimistic about future margins? Because remember the stories? Brick and mortar retailers need physical investment. Dot com retailers don't. So their margin should be higher than the brick and mortar retailers. You know why that story never really made sense as a steady state story? Let's say we carried the story through. And let's say we said 10 years from now, brick and mortar retailers will have 10% margins and online retailers will have 15% margins. You know what's going to happen? Every brick and mortar retailer is going to shut down and try to become an online retailer. You cannot have a way of doing business with two different approaches yielding two wildly different margins because they have to converge. So I gave that answer and the question was, why wouldn't they converge to 15%? Because that's not the way the world works. When you're a consumer and you can now buy things online and you can buy them in a brick and mortar store, the power is shifted to you. Over time, you'd expect the margins for retailing to come down rather than go up. So I was being pretty optimistic, assuming the margins would stay at 10%. So as my margins go from minus 36.7 to plus 10, look at what's happening to my operating losses. They become operating profit by year, by year four, and then over time they climb. And by the time I get to year 10, I'm making a huge amount of operating profits, 3.8 billion. In fact, on my spreadsheet, I've made Amazon from a small money losing company to a large money making company. My job's done, right? Not quite. There's one more loose end to tie up. To get my revenues from a billion to almost 40 billion is going to take some heavy lifting and some capital. And here's where I got stuck when I was first valuing Amazon and how to estimate reinvestment. Because I tried everything that was listed in the books, even my own, to do this. One was to take last year's capex and depreciation and just project them out, but that's not going to work because remember last year your company was a young company. God only knows how much it was reinvesting and whether that can be forecast. That didn't work. You see, why don't you use that return on capital times reinvestment rate, sustainable growth? Well, what's the return on capital for Amazon look like in 2000? A big negative number, right? Because it's operating, it has operating losses. What's its reinvestment rate? Another big negative number. Now you're saying this is very convenient. Big negative number times big negative number is a big positive number. Hey, that's not going to help you. You take operating losses and you grow them, they just become bigger losses. I tried everything for a couple of days until finally I said, look, the only number that I'm forecasting that is always positive is revenues. I have to tie reinvestment to revenues. And that actually makes intuitive sense. Young companies think in terms of revenues and the reinvestment has to be tied to revenues. That's where the sales to invested capital ratio was born. Basically, it tells you, in this case, I used sales to capital ratio of three by looking across all retailers. And here's what it tells you. A dollar of capital invested by Amazon creates three dollars of revenues. And here's how it's going to allow me to estimate reinvestment. See, my revenues are 1.1 billion right now, and they grow to 2.8 billion at the end of year one. That's a $1.7 billion increase, or, or roughly a $1.7 billion increase in revenues. You divide that by three, I get the reinvestment in year one. I take the change in revenues from years one to two, divide by three, I get the reinvestment in year two. You see, that is so simplistic. Guilty as charged. Valuing young companies, you want to keep it simple. That reinvestment includes net capex, change in working capital, acquisitions, R&D, whatever you think of is in there. And I've kind of incorporated all into one number. When in doubt, consolidate. Make it simple. And that's what I'm doing. That reinvestment is what I'm subtracting from my after-tax operating income. So let's summarize. My small revenues with revenue growth become big revenues. My losses as with, my, with, with my target margin become profits. My reinvestment reflects my growth plans. And because my growth plans are so ambitious, those reinvestment numbers are big. And if you look at what that does to my free cash flow of the firm, my free cash flow of the firm is negative for the first six years. Now, some people bring their hands and say, oh my God, this is terrible. This is called cash burn. I'm burning through so much cash. Hey, remember, this is a feature, not a bug of young growing companies. To grow, you have to reinvest. And if you have to reinvest, that's going to require cash. 
I would be very suspicious if you gave me a young growth company where the free cash flows were positive right from the beginning. It's not going to happen. So, but there is an implicit assumption I'm making for Amazon that I'm going to ask you about that. Let's see if you can isolate. See this minus 931 million in year one, right? That's my free cash for the firm. And we it was a computed number. Let's assume I'm right on every single one of my assumptions about revenues, about growth, about margins, about reinvestment. What am I assuming that Amazon is going to be able to do in year one when I put that minus 931 million in year one? Anybody? Raise capital. Am I telling you from where? Because remember, you can raise capital from equity or debt. Is there something in my valuation that tells me, tells you where I'm seeing them raising the capital? See this debt ratio in my cost of capital? We don't even think about it, right? I'm actually assuming a 99% equity, 1% debt ratio early on because they don't have, they can't afford to borrow money. That's the assumption I'm making that 931 million is almost entirely going to come from new equity. And I'm making the same assumption in year two, year three. Do you see what this implicit assumption is? Basically, I'm assuming that Amazon is going to be able to raise capital to survive the next six years. Is that a safe assumption that they'll be able to raise capital? In early 2000, I was sloppy. I assumed it. But in 2001, I was much more terrified. You know why the market had crashed for dot-com stocks? Raising capital had become more difficult. If you cannot raise capital to cover the 931 million, what's the first thing Amazon is going to try to do? What's the most discretionary part of their cash flows? See this reinvestment of 559 million? They can cut it to zero, which means they've got to give up on growth, but at least they'll survive. So that's the first thing they're going to try. But that still leaves them in the hold, right? Then they can try to cut discretionary costs. But let's say after all of this, you're still negative cash flow and you cannot raise capital. What happens to you as a company? All your cash is gone. You have a negative cash flow. The game is over, right? And if the game is over, what has to happen? You've got to sell whatever it is. And remember, you're a young company. You're not in a great bargaining position. You've got to sell yourself for pretty close to nothing. You will never get to see Nirvana. You know what Nirvana is in this valuation? It's to get to this big terminal value. So when you value Zoom or when you value Instacart right now, you, will, you might have a lot of promise in these companies. And you should bring in the promise. But remember, these are cash burning machines and they require capital to be accessible. And one of the prompts that you have in a crisis is that assumption becomes much more difficult to sustain. We'll talk about what you can do after the valuation to correct for it. But my suggestion is when you do, do your DCF, put your optimistic hat on. Assume they can raise capital. I know it's unrealistic and they can keep going because that's what I'm implicitly assuming here when I have these negative cash flows for the next six years. So I've got my free cash flow, it's negative, it doesn't turn positive till year seven. I need costs of capital to discount these cash flows. You're saying, why costs of capital? Why not one cost of capital? Because think of what I'm doing to Amazon over the next 10 years. It starts as a young money losing company. It ends as a large money making company. So let me ask you an intuitive question. What should happen to your cost of capital as you go from being a young money losing company to a more mature money making company? It should come down, right? It should come down towards what a typical mature company has. And that's exactly what I've done. When I start this process, I give Amazon a high beta, a low debt ratio, and a high cost of capital because that's exactly where they are right now. And on my spreadsheet, as I make Amazon a bigger, more mature, more profitable company, I bring that cost of capital down. I am amazed at how often when I go and look at discounted cash flow valuations, even for people who've been doing it for a long time, there seems to be this, this prevailing wisdom that you get one shot at estimating the cost of capital and then you're stuck with it forever. That is not true. In a discounted cash flow model, not only can your cost of capital change over time, it should change over time for you to be consistent. One of the questions that Philip asks is, what's the AT? AT is the after tax. 
And so, in fact, I'm glad you asked that, um, uh, Philip. Let me ask you a question. Why is my after-tax cost of debt equal to my pre-tax cost of debt for the first two years? The first three years. For the first two years, it's because I'm losing money, right? In year three, I'm actually making money. How come I still don't have taxes? Somebody, Oliver brought up NOLs. You know what I'm doing? I'm actually keeping track of my NOL. And when I first start to make money, I actually protect myself. It's not till year five till I actually start to get the full tax benefit from debt. So I actually bring NOLs into my cash flows and my cost of debt. It's the best way to incorporate NOL into my value. So my cost of capital starts at 12.84% ends at 9.61%. A little mechanical detail here that I want to add. It's a, it sounds trivial, but it can make a diff big difference. When your cost of capital changes over time, here's one of the, the prices you will pay. You can no longer use the present value function in Excel. And uh, let, let's, uh, let me explain why. Let's take the cash flow in year, year seven. It's 177 million, right? To get the present value of that cash flow, what do I need to do? I need to discount it back seven years. I have a cost of capital in year seven of 11.96%. Here's what you cannot do. You cannot discount back 177 million at 11.96% for seven years because you're missing the fact that you're a much riskier company in the first five. You're saying, what the heck are you talking about? You know what you need to do to take the present value of this cash flow? You need to discount it back at 12.84% for three years, 12.83% for one, that's called a compounded cost of capital. And if you look at every one of my discounted cash flow valuation spreadsheets, you'll see that line item for compounded cost of capital. See, why are you doing it? It's to allow for the fact that in every one of my valuations, I want to keep the door open to being able to change the cost of capital. So all I need to do then is discount this $177 million at the accumulated cost of capital over the last, next seven years. You see, how, how much of a difference can this make? It'll add about $3 billion to your value if you forget to do this, $3 billion. You'd be off by almost 20%. So keep that in mind when you're changing cost of capital. You've got to make sure you bring in that accumulated cost of capital. So my tax rate, oh, go ahead. Uh, when you are going to this level of details to change the cost of capital over time or equity, is in the implied uh, premium of the market sort of something you could I'll tell you what I I've broken this down into almost year by year detail let's say I gave you just the starting and the ending number in fact in the excel spreadsheet that's what I asked for right what's your starting cost of capital what's your ending cost of capital you know what I do in my spreadsheet rather than do this year by year contortion because if you if you think about it the year by year changes are not going doing much from years one through five right 12.84. So what I do in your spreadsheet is I take your starting cost of capital, I hold it fixed for the next five years. And then between years six and 10, you know what I do? I go from your starting cost of capital to your stable growth cost of capital in just linear steps. You know what I mean by linear steps? I take 12% as for the first five years and your ending cost of capital is 8%. I go 12%, 11.2%, 10.4%. So basically I just go to 8%. So you don't have to do this in such excruciating detail. You just have to think about a starting and an ending cost of capital and figure out a kind of simplistic mechanism for adjusting it. If you want to adjust for the risk premium and the risk free rate in your starting and ending, you can do that as well. But then make the intermediate years much simpler because you don't want to be doing this in year two, three, four, five individually because you're not that's time spent that you'd rather spend getting your revenue growth and margins right. Um, Go ahead. A similar question. Um, so uh, to decide between 12.84 and 9.61%, what were the like uh, margins of beta that you used? You don't have to. All I do is start. I start by using a, a bottom-up beta for just online retailers. I end by using a beta for all retailers. All the intermediate numbers are just calculated numbers. I'm not doing beta by year. That would be crazy. I do starting beta. I have an ending beta. Starting cost of capital. Ending cost of capital. All the middle numbers are just computed numbers. Okay. Yeah. Hey, professor, I didn't quite understand how the average uh, cost of capital comes into play 
uh, what average cost? The average cost. What, when did I, what? What is? In what context are you talking about? Something about like a compounded, um, an average rate at which. Uh, no, not accumulated, not average, right? Oh, okay. Accumulated basically means to, to discount back to 177, I have to take 1.1284 times 1.1284 times 1.1284. The denominator, I can't just take 1.1196 to the power 7, which is how we normally discount. I have to take the, the accumulated values of all seven years of cost of, cap, of discount rates. So I've got my discount rate, I've got my cash flows, I do my discounting and don't forget the elephant in the room, the big terminal value. I'll come back and talk about how much of my value comes from the terminal value and you're not going to be surprised. Uh, perhaps you're going to be surprised when I tell you how much, but kind of hold off on that. I discount the cash flows and the terminal value back at the cost of capital. What I get is my present value is $14.9 billion. So with my story of Amazon becoming a $40 billion revenue company with 10% margins and a cost of capital that of a mature company, the value that I get is $14.9 billion. I add cash, I subtract that debt. Notice how little cash Amazon had in early 2000. They were pretty arrogant about how much money they could raise. They had very little debt. I get a value for the equity of $14.6 billion. I'm done, right? One final loose end. Remember when we talked about equity options, I went through those contortions of valuing the existing options and you're saying, why are you spending so much time on a trivial detail? Do you see how much of my value Amazon has given away to its managers and employees over the previous 10 years? $2.9 billion worth of options. I subtract out the options because that's a, essentially my equity given away and divide by the actual number of shares. Don't play any games with diluted shares. Just do, value the options as options, no. and then divide by the number of shares. The value per share is $34.32. There was a question that was asked about the T-bond rate. You know how the T-bond rate was in early 2000? 6.5%. What is it now? 0.85%. In fact, if you're looking at my stable growth rate, notice it's 6%. If I use 6% today on a dollar valuation, my valuations are going to blow up like crazy. It was a different time. Higher inflation, higher growth, and it shows up. And that's why I said tie your growth rate to your risk-free rate. It'll always keep you consistent. Now, the question was, you know, Benjamin asked about free cash flows carried over. Carried over is an accounting concept. There's nothing to carry over. Right? Free cash flows are cash flows at that point in time. There's nothing carried over. Whether it's funded and shows up in balance sheets, I really don't care anymore because it's cash in, cash out. So don't worry about carrying forward and carrying back because in a DCF, it's cash in that year. It's either positive or negative. Just discount it and move on. So my value per share is $34. Stock, as I said, was trading at $84. So whenever I do a DCF, I ask people to ask me the question. You know what the question is? It's a question you need to ask to figure out whether I believe my own valuation. So if I value a company at 30 and it's trading at 20, the question you're going to ask is, what's the question you'll ask? If I value a company at 30, it's trading at 20. Are you buying the stock? Are you buying the stock? Because there are three possible answers I can give you. No, in which case, what have I told you about my own valuation? That I don't believe it. Yes and lie. You have no way of checking. Or yes and buy. Half my portfolio is composed of companies I've ended up buying because I've done a valuation and somebody says, are you buying? And if I have faith, I need to buy. So ask me the analogous question here. I'm valuing Amazon at 34. The stock is trading at 84. Obviously, I'm not thinking about buying, but what is the analogous question you need to ask me to figure out whether I trust this Amazon valuation? Are you shorting? Am I shorting? That's exactly the question I was asked. And I said, not in this lifetime. That's exactly what I said in my 2000 webcast. So people were surprised. They said, don't you have enough faith? I actually have more faith that Amazon was overvalued in January 2000 than most of the undervalued stocks that I bought. So let me ask you a follow-up question. Why, when I find a company to be undervalued, was I willing to step in and buy the stock? But Amazon is overvalued, but I'm unwilling to sell short. What is it about the process that's holding me back? Chad brings up unlimited downside. You know what? I can I can live with that. Mom pricing? 
the fact that the price can go in the opposite direction. But you know what? I have all of those uncertainties when I buy as well. I think you're all bringing up points, but when I buy, let me ask a question, and this might give you a clue. How long am I willing to wait for the market to correct itself? As long as it takes. When I buy, I control my time horizon. And I do that because I'm an individual investor. If you're a portfolio manager, you don't because your clients control it. The problem with shorting is your time horizon is often outside your control. And in early 2000, I knew this question was coming. So I called brokers to see how long they would give me on a short sale on Amazon. You know, January 2000, what's the long, what the longest I was able to get as a short sale? Six weeks. Six weeks. Now do you see why I was unwilling to bet against Amazon. Not only would I have to have faith that my value was right, I'd have to be, have faith that the market would correct within six weeks. Things have become a lot better on the short side, but it remains one of the great asymmetries in investing. And let me explain what I mean by asymmetries. When something is cheap, there's, there is a long-term strategy you can adopt to buy bargain basement in weight. When something is expensive, there's no often no analogous way to bet against things being expensive because selling short comes with a time horizon and that time horizon is short for many of the stocks that you want to sell short the most. Things, as I said, are starting to improve. In 2018, I actually sold short on Amazon for the first time in my and Amazon's lifetime and it terrified the life out of me, but I, I, got, I was able to get a year on my short sale. So things are starting to improve, but it's much more difficult to take advantage of an overvaluation than an undervaluation. And that's something I want you to think about because it is, it is, it is one of the frictions in markets, which means that you're going to have bubbles. They're far more likely to be upside bubbles than downside bubbles. Now, Jose asked the question, is 10 years too short a period? 10 years already puts you at for, for a high growth company. And I'm sure you can ask the same question about, um, you know, Zoom or Beyond Meat, you know what, 10 years is already at the 90th to 95th percentile of growth periods for a high growth company. Are there some companies that grow for longer than 10 years? Yes. But if they do, I want it to be icing on the cake for me. I have never used a growth period longer than 10 years for any company and I never will because, because if I do and I value a company to have 50 years of growth, what kind of upside can I ever get on this company? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this Amazon valuation and kind of take it apart because there are lessons here that, as I said, I still draw on when I value young companies. So as we go along, you can throw, yeah, go ahead. I have a question regarding the like expected future issuance of shares for a company that's young as such, mm -hmm. like it's not diluted to the holder, so how would... It's already built in. That's a good question you're asking. Can I hold off on, can I hold off on that question? Because you're right. Yeah. With negative cash flows and getting those cash flows from equity, you're going to be issuing new, new, more shares in the future. I think the question you're asking is when I computed the value per share, how come I'm not bringing in the fact that my share count is going to increase over time? I'll talk about one of the magical things that happens in a DCF that allows you to ignore that share count. But let me hold off on that because that's one of the things I'll come back to. Uh, just one question. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when, uh, as the uh, operating margin approaches 10%, is there yep. logic to when you approach it? Which yep, we'll I'll talk about that as well. Uh, so in fact, I'm going to take what I did in this valuation and take each piece apart so you can see the mechanics of how I assume the revenue growth, how the margins are changing, why the cost of capital is adjusting over time. So I'll talk about each of those. Thank you. So let's start with the first lesson. Remember when we talked about betas, I said don't trust regression betas. Well, that goes in spades when you're valuing a young company. You can look up a regression beta for Amazon, Amazon in early 2000. Here's actually the, the Bloomberg beta for Amazon in early 2000. There's a wrong regression beta, 2.23, right? You think this is good, I have a beta. Look at the standard error in the beta, it's 0.50. The true beta for Amazon, if you look at the regression, could be anywhere from 1.2 to 3.2. And that's going to be the case with almost all young companies. If you take Zoom, you can actually get a Bloomberg beta for the one year they've been listed, but it's useless. It's complete noise. So what's the solution? Do what we do with every company, do bottom-up betas. And in the case of Amazon, here's what I did. 
I used online retailers as my bottom-up peer group for the first five years. Why? Because right now when I, well, in 2000 when I thought about Amazon, I thought online first and retail afterwards. But as, a, as Amazon becomes bigger as a company, my argument is it's going to be retail first that happens to be online. So after year five, my bottom-up beta was all retailers. So it's actually a clever way in which you can take young companies, for instance, a Zoom, and rather than give it just a business services beta, you can find a subset of business services companies that are younger and, and more risky and use their betas to come up with a starting beta. And then as Zoom gets bigger, you give it the beta for business services collectively. So it's a bottom-up beta with some nuance added to it. So, so that's the first lesson. Second, let me talk about the two big assumptions, the revenue growth assumption and the margin assumption. Let's start with revenue growth. I used a 42% compounded revenue growth for the next 10 years. And your first reaction should have been, and this is legitimate, is how the heck did you come up with only 42%, uh, with 42%? Why not 45? Why not 35? I'll give away the game. And this is actually something I had to learn the hard way. When the first time I valued Amazon, I tried to do it the way I was taught to do valuation. Sequentially. You know what I mean by sequentially? Here's how we value companies usually. We do year one, then we do year two, then we do year three, and then we move through time. You try that with a young company, you are going to go crazy sooner rather than later. And here's why. You're going to see mounting uncertainty as you go through time. And by the time you get to year four, you say, I have no idea what's going on. I'm just making up stuff. So here's what I did with Amazon and I continue to do with any young company. I put my optimist hat on and I said, what do I visualize a successful Amazon to look like 10 years out? It's almost like you have to stop and say, I'm not going to think about year one. I'm going to think of what success means for Amazon. And there your biases about the company, what you know about the company are going to come in. And in early 2000, I liked Amazon as a company. I liked the way Jeff Bezos was running the company. I thought it was going to be a successful retail company. So to determine what success would look like in terms of revenues, here's what I did. I took the 10 largest retailers in early 2000. They were all brick and mortar retailers. They had Walmart was on the list, you know, Gap was on the list, Macy's was on the list. I looked at that list and I said, you know what, where on this list would I expect Amazon to be 10 years from now? I said, is it going to be like Walmart? I said, not really. It's a different business model. Walmart goes for lots of revenues, low margins. I don't think that's the Amazon pathway. So I ended up in early 2000 putting Amazon fifth on that list. I said, that, I think it's going to be successful. It's going to be not as big as Walmart, but it's going to be much bigger than the Gap because it sells everything. And when I looked at the fifth largest retailer in 2000, guess what their revenues were? About 40 billion. I've given away the game. I'm going to start at a billion. I want to get to about 40 billion in year 10. You see those growth rates that I have? They look awfully precise, right? 150, 100, 75, 50, 30. You see, how the hell did you come up with them? I make a confession. I made them up. Exactly right. I made them up. And if you push me really hard on any of them, I'd concede them to you. So if you say in year one, I think the revenue growth is going to be 161.51%. I say, you can have that. Year two, it's going to be 93.55%. You can have that. You give me the starting and the ending numbers on revenues. I control this valuation. In young companies, it's the end game that drives your value. So when you value Zoom, it's not what you think revenues that will be next year that's going to drive your valuation. It's what you see as revenues for a successful Zoom. Is it going to be closer to 30 billion or 12 billion? That's going to drive your valuation. That's why storytelling is so critical in young companies because your story about the company determines the market size and so uh, Agent Marino asked me, is it, uh, is it standard practice to guesstimate revenue growth? Standard practice with young companies is you don't value them. There is no standard practice. You are writing the script for these companies because people price them. They don't value them. Okay? So if you look at the revenue growth, so Julian raises an interesting question, which is I said the revenues to the fifth largest company. Basically what I did was these were 10 mature companies. I applied the inflation rate as a growth rate for the next 10 years. So this is an inflation adjusted number, the 40 billion. So I used the end game to determine my growth rate. So my advice to you, if you're using my Excel spreadsheet and you're playing with that revenue growth rate, you're going to say, what the, 
how do I know to use it, whether to use a 35 or a 40% growth rate? Don't focus on the growth rate. Focus on your dollar revenues in your, in, in your 10, because that's what your story should be driving you towards. So small revenues to big revenues. I'm going to pause because this is a big part of valuing young companies. And it's you're going to feel so uncomfortable doing this. You know why? Because you're playing God. You're trying to make a judgment in a company that's still being formed, but there's no way around it. To value these companies, you have to make that judgment. Any questions on that first piece? Just a uh, quick question regarding your uh, year 10 revenue growth. I can see that it's clearly equal to your um, T-bond rate. So it's le it, le it said a little less. My T-bond rate was 6.5%. I said it right. slightly below that, yeah. Right. So uh, if we wanted to do a similar exercise today, it'll be that, it'll be 0.85 percent. Uh, yeah. So would we essentially have to make sure that we stay within the bounds of the? Um, no, it'll automatically get taken care of. So what will happen is you can still start with Zoom at a very high growth rate, but as you approach your 10, it's going to go to a much lower number. But here's the compensating factor: is that 0.85 percent also helping you in your valuation? Yeah, it shows up in your cost of capital as a much lower number. So don't worry, it'll already, it, the R minus G will take care of it, right? So I'm not I'm not at rewarding Amazon by giving it a 6% growth rate because that 6.5% T-bond rate leaves my cost of capital at a really high number still. So it takes care of itself if you're consistent. Shashank asked me a question of whether I, no, he says, are you saying you don't value, I value young companies. I'm saying most people who say they value young companies are not valuing them, they price them. And that's because it's not even that they can't generate positive cash flows, it's they don't think they can estimate cash flows because there's too much uncertainty. They're not even, they're not even trying. A typical VC pricing, here's what you do, you project out earnings or revenues into a future year, you apply a multiple to it a price earnings ratio or a revenue multiple, you come up with a pricing three years out, then you attach an arbitrary discount rate, 50% to discount. It's complete back of the envelope, made up numbers. But that's their argument is you can't really value companies. So I'm saying you can, but to do it, you have to visualize what success will look like in your company. No other questions about revenues? Okay, so let's move on. Perry, go ahead. We do not put any failure probabilities in this? No, don't do it in the middle of a DCF. As I said, do your DCF with your optimist hat firmly on. I'll give you a way of adjusting for failure at the end. Okay. So now let's move to margins. What are my starting margins? Minus 36.71%, right? Where do I want them to end up? 10%. So I might, so when I start the spreadsheet, I have the trailing 12 month number, I have the terminal year number. I've got to fill in all the middle numbers and it's giving me nightmares even thinking about estimating margins in year one, year two. So here's what I did. I set the spreadsheet on an autopilot and it filled in the middle numbers. So I'm going to ask you to guess what my autopilot approach was because I'll give away the clues. I'm starting at minus 36.7. I'm ending at plus 10. Can you figure out what the algorithm was that I fed the computer or my Excel spreadsheet that allowed me to come up with margins in year one, year two, year three, year four? How am I getting minus 13? It looks awfully precise, right? It looks like I have a crystal ball. I don't. It's a very simple algorithm. Anybody? Too complicated for me. I thought about logs, exponents. No, it's actually even easier. Did you divide the difference by two? Exactly. Do you see what I mean by, who is that? Uh, Shashank. Shashank, tell the class again what I'm, what you mean by dividing by two. Uh, I think you took the uh, minus 36.71 and then positive 10. That's a difference of 46.7. I divided by two. That gives me an improvement of 23.35%. That's year one. That brings me to minus 13.35. In year one, yeah. I take the difference again. Minus 13.35 to 10, take the difference, divide by two. I get. You think, why divide by two? Why not? In fact, whenever I build a spreadsheet, here's what I try to do. I try to create a simple mechanism where if you disagree with me, you can change that mechanism. 
I am assuming that Amazon is going to be able to move to its margins pretty quickly, half the distance to my goal every year. Let's say you listen to my story and you say, I agree with your optimism, but I think Amazon is going to have a lot more pain before it sees profits. You know how you can do that? Instead of moving a half the distance to goal, let's say you moved a quarter of the distance, one quarter of the way. You'll still start with minus 36.7, you'll still end at plus 10, but you know what's going to happen? I'm going to lose money for a longer period before I can turn things around. It's the simplest way I could figure to bring in pathways to profitability and disagreements into the analysis. So when you look at my existing spreadsheet, the way I do this is I let you pick the year of convergence where your margins move to your target. If you pick 10 years, I adjust your margins gradually over the next 10 years. If you say year five, I move it much more quickly. It's a mechanism for you to, in your story, tell me, I think my company is going to move back to that margin pretty quickly or slowly, and this allows me to bring it in. So my margin started at minus 36.7. I still end at plus 10, and I move across time. Now, Jonathan has a question, a company like Pinterest, which doesn't have a defined comp set, why doesn't it? How does Pinterest make money, Jonathan? Is it at this? It's on. It's entirely online ads. You know what? There, are, you actually with Pinterest have some really big role models. Who are the two most successful online advertising companies in the world? One is Google. Ryan brought it up. The other is Facebook. That is what immense success will look like. Do you think Pinterest has a, even a chance of becoming a Facebook or a Google? Seems unlikely. And likely, they're more likely to be successful if they're successful as a niche online advertising company, right? More like a snap, a smaller segment of the audience. Pinterest is very heavily female based of a, I mean, I'm not trying to be sexist, but I think eight, what 80 something percent of its, um, of, of the people on Pinterest are women, not men, is, am I right? It's a, it's a high percentage of, so I think in a sense, it's going after a niche market. The niche market is very loyal, that's a good news. So the story you tell for Pinterest will not give them the kind of revenues of a Facebook or a Google. It'll give them the kinds of revenues of a Twitter or a Snap. So that's what I would think of as your peer group when you think about what should I be modeling them on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at my EBIT, it's just my operating margin times my revenues. And I already said why you don't have taxes in your one and two because you're losing money. In year three, you don't have taxes because even NOL you're carrying forward. Year four, you still have some NOL left. In year five, the NOL is completely gone. I have my after-tax operating income. This was the heavy lifting part of the of the valuation. And before I leave this page, I want to give any last chances for you know kind of people to throw questions before we do the next phase of what I want to do. Oh, uh, the, uh, ultimately, I gave them the corporate tax rate. I said, eventually, you're going to have to pay the 25% tax rate. And that, I think, is a pretty safe assumption now because that's both the U.S. and the global tax rate. That once you get successful and you're in steady state, 25% seems to me a kind of a good target to pay. In your valuation, did you ever think that Amazon will grow global in that sense? This is a global, 40, 40 billion dollars requires them to be a global retailer. Global at least in the 2000 cents of global. Remember, you can't use hindsight. In 2000, what we thought of as global was mostly US, Europe, with a little bit coming from Asia and Latin America, right? Because those markets were not th that lucrative. Now, I was waiting for somebody to say, why didn't you bring in the cloud business into your revenues? The only clouds I was thinking about in 2000 were in the sky. I mean, there was no such thing as the cloud. So I'll, I'll admit there are things that Amazon did 8, 10, 12 years later they didn't see coming. But you can, you can never forecast the unforecastable. You can just do what you know at that point in time. So this was global as in the 2000 cents of global, which is much smaller than today's global because the markets were much more focused on the US and Europe. And it is a retail firm. I did not give it any other businesses. So that part, I, you know, I, I missed some of the things Amazon started to do 12 years later. But that's neither here nor there. Okay, so let me kind of... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, now that Amazon is, is very clearly moving into new businesses, sort of 
almost first then? I'll come back to it. I will actually show you my Amazon valuation from 2018 and you're going to see what I see Amazon as today. Okay, so hold off on that because I'll, I'll show you my 2018 valuation and story. So let's keep moving. So, you know, I was asked about the 10 year growth period and why I stopped. I think Jose asked me that question as, and, and uh, the answer was, hey, the, the, the typical company doesn't grow for that long. In fact, one of my most depressing graphs, if I think like a growth investor is this one, which is a study that looked at IPOs. And the revenue growth rate in an IPO relative to the growth rate of other companies in the pure group to which that growth company belonged. So remember, IPOs are often your highest growth companies, the star companies. So what the study found in year one, one year after the IPO, was not surprising. The IPO companies had a revenue growth rate 15% higher than the pure group. You see, this is why I bought that IPO company, high growth. Two years later, if you track these IPO companies, their revenue growth rate is only 7% higher. Three years later, it's 3% higher. By the time you get to year five, you cannot tell the growth company from the pure group. What does it tell me? In most growth companies, growth fades really fast. 10 years is already at the 90th percentile, maybe even the 95th percentile of growth periods for growth companies. So that's why I stop after 10 years. I don't do 25 or 50, not because companies cannot grow that long, but those are the exceptions and I don't want to value, value my company right from the beginning to be the exception because then I get no upside. Now let me go back to the specifics of the Amazon valuation because there's, there's something in my valuation that I can use because often when you're valuing young companies, you're projecting revenue growth margin, you start asking the question, am I building what I call a dreamscape company? You know what a dreamscape company is? These are companies that can exist only in your dreams or on spreadsheets. Because you can make up some companies in spreadsheets that cannot survive in real life. So here's what I use when I do valuations of young companies to make sure I'm not wandering off the reservation. So I have my revenue projections and I told you how I got them. I have my change in revenues every year. No, because basically I take that. And I said I use a sales to capital ratio of three because that's what retailers were generating as revenues for every dollar of capital investing. Now, I've kept that sales to capital ratio fixed at three for the next 10 years, but you might have a story where that changes. In what way? You might believe that as your company gets bigger, it gets more efficient about investing. What does that mean? It get more, gets more revenues per dollar of capital, which means you can start with three for the first five years and perhaps increase over time. Conversely, your company might be, get less efficient over time, in which case you can lower the sales to capital ratio over time. But that sales to capital ratio becomes my, my, my entry point for estimating reinvestment. Because here's what I do. I take the change in revenue in year one, 1676, I divide by three, I get the reinvestment. That, that's my reinvestment. But remember, what I reinvest becomes my change in invested capital. Everything is linked up to everything else. So when I say I'm reinvesting 559 million, I'm also telling my invested capital goes up by 559 million. So what I do in my valuation is I keep track of what my reinvestment is doing to my invested capital over time. I'm saying, why are you bothering to do it? Because remember I projected out after-tax operating income. If I divide the after-tax operating income that I projected based on my margins by the invested capital I'm getting from my reinvestment, I get what I call an imputed return on capital. Why imputed? Because I'm really not estimating return capital. It's coming out of my other assumptions. You're saying, well, how does that help? Well, if you look at year 10 for Amazon, my imputed return on capital, I think is 20.39%. So the question I had to ask myself in early 2000 is, am I comfortable with that return on capital in year 10? And for Amazon, my answer was yes, because remember, T-bond rates were 6.5%. The typical retail firm is having an 18% return on capital. 20.39% did not sound outlandish. You know what would have brought up a red flag? If that number had been 200.39%, you know what that would have told me? You're not reinvesting enough. And if I'm listening to my own spreadsheet, there's an easy fix, right? If I'm not reinvesting enough, I would lower my sales to capital ratio. If my return on capital in year 10 were 2.76%, that's too low. I'm not re I'm reinvesting too much. If I'm reinvesting too much, I can raise my sales to capital ratio. 
keep track of the reputed return on capital for your company, especially if you're projecting revenue growth and margins, because it'll tell you when your reinvestment is giving you strange numbers. Incidentally, if you're using my, my Ginzu spreadsheet, this is actually computed in the spreadsheet. It's the very last line item in the valuation output worksheet. Take a look at it and make sure that the return on capital you're giving your company in year 10 is not some outlandish number, triple digit number or a one and a half percent or a two percent return on capital. It's a simple way to make sure that your assumptions are consistent. So, you know, I think Shashank had a question about uh, operating leases. Remember, the invested capital includes R&D capitalized. That's why we go to all that trouble of capitalizing R&D and operating leases is to get that invested capital right. And then your reinvestment will take care of the change in those items as well. So this is your true return on invested capital. So any questions on this page and what I'm trying to do on this page? So here I'm first computing reinvestment using the sales to capital ratio. And then I'm using that reinvestment to make sure that I'm building a company that I'm comfortable with as a company in steady state. No questions? Okay. Now let me deal with, I, I don't know, the, earlier there was a question, I uh, forget now who asked it about those free cash flows um, in future years being negative and having to issue checks. Now, I, it was earlier in the class, but I do remember that question. And here's the nice thing about doing a discounted cash flow evaluation and doing it right. I'm going to take you back. I know this is confusing because I'm going back in slides, but I'm going to take you back to my original valuation. See these negative cash flows for the first six years? Minus a billion, minus a billion, minus a billion. That's a lot of negative cash flows, right? When I compute my present value today, if I hadn't had those six negative cash flows, this present value would have been about 18 to 19 billion. So when I when I brought in those negative cash flows, I've actually reduced my value for the firm by about 25%. Do you see what I mean by that? By reduced, those negative cash flows have lowered my present value. I've already incorporated the dilution effect by doing that. And because I've already incorporated the dilution effect, I can just divide by the number of shares. In fact, if I adjust the number of shares outstanding today for expected share count going up in the future years, I'll be double counting. So one of the nice things about doing a DCF right is you don't have to account for future share count because it's already reflected my current present value. So keep that in mind. There will be new equity issues in the future. Your share count will increase in the future, but because your present value already reflects the present value of those negative cash flows, you don't want to adjust your share count today for those future share issuances. It makes your life a lot simpler. So if you get a chance, you go to my blog, I actually took a Tesla valuation I did about five years ago in excruciating detail to show how the dilution is already accounted for. So if you don't believe me, check out that post because it will give you the same thing. In fact, Oliver asked the question about buybacks, exactly the same result because I'm counting the positive cash flows that give you the buybacks. I can't also adjust the share count for the fact that I'm going to reduce the share count in the future. You can't count the cash flows and the share count effect in the same valuation. And that's why when you do discounted cash flow valuation, you just stick with the share count today. You're not being blind about future share count changes, but you're essentially saying my valuation, I've done the present value, that captures that effect. Okay. Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, when you are doing those negative cash flows, you are discounting them? Yes. And is, isn't that sort of weird philosophically? Like I'm saying... Yeah. Cash, no, no, wait. Philosophically, what does it say? It doesn't say positive cash flows are risky, negative cash flows are not. Risk is risk. Uncertainty is uncertainty. Don't try to be conservative and say, look, because of negative cash flows, I'm going to treat them as certain. And because of positive cash flows are uncertain. The reason we discount is because of uncertainty, not because something is positive or something is negative. If you had a guaranteed negative cash flow, I'll tell you one that might happen. Let's say you're an infrastructure company and your cash flows for the next five years are costs you're going to incur in building roads. Then you can discount back at a lower rate. You know why? Because those costs are pretty much guaranteed. You have to spend them. 
So discount at a lower rate because something is certain, not because something is positive or negative. But I, I can understand where you're coming from. You're saying it's a negative cash flow. Am I not rewarding people for being uncertain? This has nothing to do with reward or punishment. It's got everything to do with uncertainty, which is why we do discounting. Uh, professor? Yes. So, uh, when you discount those um, negative cash flow, do you just use the regular method? Exactly, exactly. The, the minus in front of a cash flow doesn't change the way we discount. Okay, because earlier on the session you were mentioning like for year seven, for example. No, the same thing applies. When I say the regular method, this, the regular method applies for every cash flow, positive or negative. So that cumulated cost of capital is the regular method. There is no other regular method. Okay, got okay. it. So that's always the case, whether you're positive or negative cash flows. Any other questions? Now let's talk about the fact that I've been in denial all the way through. You know what I mean by denial? All this valuation that I've done, I've assumed that Amazon's going to make it, that it'll have access to capital. So you can argue that even the $35 that I've got is an optimistic valuation because there's a chance that Amazon will not make it. Now, when I say this to analysts, some analysts say, well, it's a public company, all, all, all companies make it. That's because so many of the companies we deal with are mature companies that you can even say stuff like this. Because we do know, especially with young companies, that a lot of them don't make it. This is actually from the Department of Labor, which actually keeps a very interesting database of startups and different businesses. And what percentage of those startups make it through year one? So the way to read this, if you take a natural resource company, one year after they start up, they, there are about 81% of these companies that have survived. Two years later, less than 70%. By the time you get to year 10, less than 40% of the companies that started the game are still in the game. So don't take this table, this graph too literally in terms of numbers. What it's telling you, a lot of companies, which are young companies, don't make it through to become going concerns. And in a discounted cash flow valuation, you're valuing your company as a going concern. Now your reaction is, what the heck do I do about this? So let's assume it was two, early 2000, you'd done the valuation of Amazon, you'd come up with $35 per share. And then you said, you know what, I'm being unrealistic here. There's a chance that Amazon will not make it through because it might not be able to raise capital. But you have to remember, this is early 2000 and the dot-com sector is booming, you probably would have attached a low likelihood. Let's say you attached a 10% chance that Amazon would not make it. You know what you'd do? You'd actually, and this is actually just the same graph, you'd take your discounted cash flow valuation, attach a 90% chance to that valuation because there's a 90% chance of going concern, then take the 10% chance you would not make it and ask a follow-up question. What will my equity be worth if I don't make it? And if you're a young tech company and you don't make it, what's your equity going to be worth if you don't make it? Most of the time, nothing. There's nothing there to sell. If you're a company with tangible assets, maybe there's a liquidation value, but it's going to be zero. You know what I'm going to do then? I'm going to take 90% times $35, which is my DCF value, plus 10% times zero. And I'm going to come up with an expected value of $31.50. That's exactly what I've built into the spreadsheet. If you keep going down, one of the defaults I said is, hey, I've assumed your company will make it. Do you want to change that default? And if you change the default and set a failure rate, I ask you, what will you get in, if you fail? And I give you choices. But essentially what I'm allowing you to factor in is the likelihood that your equity will not make it. Now, Jessica raises a very interesting question, which is, when you have failure in a company, the probability of failure is more likely to happen early in the life rather than late. In other words, your, the probability of failure is going to be up front. In fact, that's why I think zero is the right answer, because if it happens up front, your equity is going to be worth zero. If it happens in your eight or nine, you probably could get some equity value. But if you want to do this more explicitly by year, you could, but it's going to be a pain in the neck. So that's why I would say just do a DCF, have your optimist hat on, act as if your company is going to make it. And after you're done with your DCF, then ask yourself, what's the chance I will not make it and tie up that loose end? 
uh, you know, it's the cleanest way of dealing with failure that I can think of. And it sure beats what VCs do, which is to hike up your required rate of return to a made up number, 50, 60, 70%. Discount rates are not good instruments for adjusting for failure risk. They were never designed for that. Bring it in after your DCF and use that probability to adjust for it. So any of you valuing young companies, keep that in your arsenal because it's a good way of adjusting for failure. So I'm going to pause there and I allow you to ask some questions about that failure thing because you're saying, how do I decide 10, 20, 30 percent? Don't don't spend too much time on it. The younger and more money losing your company, the higher the property has to be. Given that many of your companies you're looking at are in the tens of millions already in pricing, you have to think about that as working in their favor because the VCs don't want to let them go under. Now, if this were a $1 million company, the probability of failure is probably like 60%. If it's a $100 million company, it's probably already dropped to 20%. If it's a $8 million company, then it's closer to 10%. And you throw this crisis on top, it makes life even messier. But make a judgment because that's all you can do. And I can't tell you what the right number is, but it, it definitely is not zero. Yeah. Now, Benjamin asked the question, how many of these companies are acquired? They might be acquired, and that might be your floor value. And if they're acquired, it's going to be a fraction of your estimated value. In fact, one of the choices I give you in my spreadsheet is I let you set that as a percentage of your estimated value, arguing that if Apple buys your company out and you're in distress, you're not going to get your full value. You're probably going to get half that value or 25% of that value. Any, any questions? Would we use the same approach for uh, young companies that have already IPO'd? Or for any IPO'd? company. This is, this is irrelevant. Whether you, one of the things going public gives you is it reduces that failure risk because now you can access public markets. It, it's not just VCs. But it doesn't disappear, right? The day Zoom went public, its failure probably, probably went from 15% down to 12%. Right? But it doesn't go to zero just because they're a public company. Professor, uh, yeah. a question related to ROIC, uh, like um, in a perfectly competitive market, um, some people argue that um, ROIC has to equal cost of capital. Only in steady state. Um, is there a way to kind of value company using this notion? Uh, well, that's all you do is building to stable growth. You know, that's it shows up in your term value calculation, right? So it's that's the McKinsey default. In your terminal value set, return on capital equal to cost of capital, your terminal value will then reflect that assumption. It's exactly, you've built it in. Okay. Professor. Yep. Uh, but in your Uber valuation, your ROIC is much higher. Absolutely, than because I think they have competitive advantage. This is a network. We talk about networking benefits. You know what that means, right? You get so big. It becomes almost impossible for somebody to displace you. It's going to show up as a sky high ROIC. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No. Yeah, go ahead. What's the long term link between ROIC and equity returns on stocks? Very, it's very weak. You know why? because it's already priced in. Google has a really high return invested capital, but the market already knows it. You're not the only one. So if people say, why, why don't I just buy stocks with high ROIC? You're buying good companies, but you're buying, paying a really high price for it. Your returns might actually be better buying bad ROIC companies and hoping the market has become even more pessimistic than that ROIC demands. Again, if you go to my blog, I have, I have this contrast between good companies and good investments, and that's one of the contrasts I drop. You know what there's a link? It's high ROIC companies trade at high multiples of book value. Interesting, they were doing this math that the, the compounded stock return on Amazon, if you bought it the, the day you did your valuation, would mm. be like 17 at Amazon. Yeah. yeah. Because, and in fact, if you, if you take the most success, I'll give you an analogy. If you take the most successful baseball players in history and you compare them to what people thought they would hit as rookies, even if they were superstar rookies. Let's say you took the subset of the 20 best 20 year olds in any sport. And then you looked at the most successful players and you picked only the most successful players. What should you find? 
that they overshot what you expected because some of those 20 you know, potential, you know, that you thought had superstar potential are going to crash and burn. So if you take the most successful companies of today, if you're doing your DCF right, they should overshoot your numbers. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if you're getting exactly what you predicted for those companies, God help you in all those other companies you value because you're probably overshooting like crazy on those companies. So that's exactly what you'd predict, right? There's a selection bias. So, I. any other questions? Uh, professor, yeah. uh, normally we assume to use uh, the current risk-free rate for... Growth rate and perpetuity, yeah. But currently it's only like 0.85%. And you know what, it's giving you a low cost. You know, whenever CFOs, uh, you know, they always moan about the fact that the growth rate is so low. Then I say, well, are you complaining that your cost of capital is so low? You can't have your cake and eat it too. So if you want the risk-free rate to be 0.85% of your cost of capital, then your growth rate has to be 0.85%. In the spreadsheet, I give you a default where you can change the risk-free rate after year 10 to a higher number, but don't expect it to give you a higher value because when you change that risk-free rate, your growth rate will be higher as well, but so will your cost of capital. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I finished this valuation and I come up with uh, 35 stocks of trading at 84. I get a very plaintive question from somebody in the audience who must own Amazon. They said, is it possible that Amazon is worth $84 per share? You know what my answer was? Of course it's possible. Possible is such a weak word. In fact, here, here's all I need. I need a much higher revenue growth and a much higher margin. I actually do this on almost every valuation I do. Basically look for break-even points on what has to be true for the market price to be right. Try this on Zoom right now. It's kind of scary. What the markets, what the revenues will have to be for Zoom to be worth $170 per share. I mean, it's got to be four times larger than the entire online meeting market today. The, you know, Zoom's revenues alone. It's a break-even point. You're saying, how do I use this? Well, to, to justify Amazon's valuation, I would need either a 60% revenue growth and 8% margins or a 55% revenue growth and 10% margins. And I've got to ask myself, am I comfortable making those assumptions? And if the answer is no, I shouldn't be buying Amazon. I'm getting to the same place of not buying Amazon or finding Amazon overvalued. I'm just doing it in a different way by asking these break-even questions. Now, after you're done with your valuation, um, you're going to feel really uncomfortable when you value young companies. Right? In fact, you're probably going to feel uncomfortable valuing any company in this environment. And here's what you got to tell yourself. You're going to be wrong, and you're going to be wrong 100% of the time. You think that is terrible. But here's the consolation price. You don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. So here's all you can do and here's all you can ask of yourself. You can't ask yourself, am I right? Because you're definitely wrong. All you can ask is, am I making the best judgments I can and being as unbiased as I can with the information I have to value the company today? Because in hindsight, you're always going to be wrong. But that's okay, as long as you're less wrong than everybody else. So we're getting towards the end. So I'm going to leave you with a slide that kind of gives you at least a snapshot of my Amazon valuations from 2000 to 2003. There's my Amazon valuation in 2000 that I just showed you. Amazon was tremendously overvalued, right? And I said, I'm not selling short and I gave you my reason. One year later, the dot-com boom bust. My value, I revalued Amazon. Economy was in a recession. I was a lot more pessimistic. My value went from $35 down to about $22. You're saying, that is terrible. Your value dropped by that much? Hey, if you think I changed my mind going from 35 to 22, what did the market do? It went from 84 to 11, and I was trapped. You know what I mean by trapped? I was asked the question, am I buying Amazon? And I couldn't do the song and dance I did the previous year. I actually bought Amazon for the first time in 2001. In 2002, I revisited my valuation. And that's something to remember. You can't just buy something and forget about it for the rest of eternity. It's got to kind of live up to its value. So the next year I revalued, the value had gone up again to about 32. The stock price had increased, but it still remained undervalued to stay in my portfolio. 2003, I valued it again. It almost doubled my value, but the price almost tripled. I sold Amazon in 2003. 
I bought Amazon four times in the last 20 years. I've sold Amazon four times in the last 20 years. When you play the value game, it's not a one-time game. Just because you find Zoom to be overvalued today doesn't mean you've got to give up on Zoom because who knows what two years from now will bring. So it's something to keep in mind and I'm going to close with one final slide. I usually don't do this, but um, since I had my 2000 valuation in 2014, I went back and looked at the actual numbers for Amazon relative to what I had expected them to be in my original forecast. I wanted to see how wrong I was. So I took my revenues, their own forecasted revenues. In fact, I was pretty close in 2010. And after that, Amazon started growing much faster than I thought they would. So they're growing faster than I thought I would. So I'm looking at the facts and I'm saying, hey, they're growing faster. My original margins, I was predicting their margins would hit 10%. It turned out that the margins were actually much lower than I thought they would be. In fact, they got even lower over time. By 2014, here's what I'd learned about Amazon. It was going to grow a lot more than I thought it was because it was finding new businesses, but it was going to be a lot less profitable than I thought it was because of the way it was approaching these businesses. I described Amazon in 2012 as my field of dreams company. If you've watched the movie Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner's building this baseball field in the middle of nowhere and he says, if we build it, they will come. Talking about you know, the legends of the past. Amazon's business model seemed to be if we build revenues, profits will come and they were incredibly patient. My story that I will show you in the start of the next class for Amazon at the start of 2018 is very different from my story in 2000 and I never apologize for changing my story. You shouldn't because the world is changing around you. The nature of valuation is your story has to change. So start in the next class, I will give you my 2018 valuation of Amazon. I'll give you a neat little trick you can use to deal with uncertainty. And we'll talk about more companies on the dark side. But thank you and um, I hope you have a good day. Any final questions before I let you go? Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, about, uh, we talked about Uber, the cost of capital, RYC, but then in Boeing, you have them set as equal in perpetuity. Yeah. And Boeing has the same competitive advantage as Uber, right? Well, same competitive advantage, but you have very, very weak customers, right? You don't have much pricing power. Your airline's going to pay 20% more. You and Airbus are the only games in town, you're right. Because you're the only game in town, you say, well, I, should, I can charge more. But your clients are just a basket case of companies, right? It's a collection of factors. It's not just what are my competitive advantages, but who are my customers and can I charge them more? And your customers are all going bankrupt. How the heck are you going to charge them more? Okay. Yeah. And Boeing is a much more... Um Company it's a much more mature company. You can actually look at the return invested capital over time. The only problem is that buybacks have made their book value almost meaningless. Justin has a question about capital gains. There are no ca capital gains are at the individual investor level. So don't bring in capital gains issues into your valuations because you're not looking at individual tax rates. So. It's always there, and for companies, there's no capital gains issue. It's all it, it, it's all marginal tax rate. So just use that. No other questions. Okay, so we're going to end for the day, and I will see you on Wednesday. So watch for the email after today. So I'll kind of summarize what we did, and perhaps give you a couple of readings in case you're interested. And if you can get those DCFs into me, I, I'm already starting to get them in. I'll get them back to you as soon as I can.